Welcome to Climate Fest. Good morning. My name is Garrett Wong. I work for the City of Santa Monica. I lead the city's climate policy and energy projects and programs. There's a lot of new, exciting things happening in the space of energy. We'll talk about that today. Before I do that, I'd like to introduce our panel, our distinguished panel, to my right or your left. Immediately to my right is Ted Flanagan. Ted Flanagan is the president of Ecomotion, and Ecomotion, uh, full disclosure, is the consultant to the city running the Solar Santa Monica program. And the Solar Santa Monica program, some of you may know, helps property owners, both residential and commercial, find their way to getting solar. We know that solar, purchasing solar is not a, not a usual experience that people go through. Uh, so it's a hard, it's a complicated process sometimes. It's a new technology for many people. So we try to help you understand what it takes and what to understand when you make that investment. Ted has been in the energy business for uh, over 30 years, uh, both East Coast and West Coast. He served in the New York Power Authority as well as LADWP. He does consulting through his company, Ecomotion, on a lot of advanced energy projects, which he will probably speak about in a moment. Sitting next to Ted is Ted Bardicke. We have two Teds. So Ted B. Ted Bardicke is the Executive Director of the Clean Power Alliance of Southern California. Not many of you know what that is which is okay, because it's very new. But it will be a very big, new, exciting development happening in Southern, in the, in Southern California. Uh, before that, Ted was working with the office, or sorry, the office of LA Mayor Garcetti, uh, where he was the Director of Infrastructure, as well as the Deputy Director for the Mayor's Sustainability Office. Last but not least is Annette Tran from Southern California Edison for many of whom is the existing electrical utility provider. Uh, Annette is the Energy and Environmental Policy Advisor at SCE, as we like to refer to it. And she's working on all matters uh, related to transportation and electrification, including developing new pilots and programs to increase charging infrastructure and electric vehicle adoption in California. So a lot of what we've already heard today in the mobility space and uh, at the state level. So, so I mentioned what TED does, and we're going to talk about a little bit more of what that does so that way people have an understanding of what we're talking about. So one of Santa Monica's goals is to get to 100% renewable energy. Now getting to 100% renewable energy means that we have to be very ambitious and very aggressive when it comes to buying power. And currently, most people who are served on the Southern California Edison territory are served that power. Southern California Edison's, almost a third of it is coming from renewable energy resources. We heard from our state leaders that utility power will start, will have to increase its renewal, renewable resources up to 50% by the year 2030. But cities, are wanting to go faster and farther to reach their carbon goals, just like Santa Monica. And so local governments can actually get in the business of energy. We get involved at the procurement level. So Santa Monica is joining hands with other communities to buy power on the energy market and then sell it to you, customers. Edison will still remain in business. They're responsible for the transmission and the distribution. They own the wires in the, on the poles. They own the wires in the ground. They're still going to be in business, but their business model is changing as a result. But ultimately, what's delivered to you is a different product as the customer. It will be higher content renewables, and the money that is paid for that product comes back to the local government versus going to the utility. So it empowers the local governments to do a little bit more when it comes to energy programs, uh, beneficial energy rates, um, and, and things that can also help to 
essentially decarbonize other sectors of the economy. And we'll talk about that later as well. There's also a challenge that happens when we try to increase the amount of renewables on the utility grid. A lot of people in this field refer to what's called the duck curve. And that means that essentially the net energy consumed over time, over the course of a day, sometimes changes, it fluctuates. We use a little bit more in the morning, we use a lot in the afternoon, and in the middle we actually are starting to go negative. And the reason for that is because we're actually doing a pretty good job at installing a lot of new renewable energy, which tends to come on when the sun is high, or when the winds are strong. So we have an imbalance of when energy is generated, when energy is needed. The challenge for renewable energy is that you can't turn it on like that. And you can't turn it on very quickly. And again, it's only really available in the middle of the day. So there's a huge gap between the late afternoon into the evening when the sun is not shining. So things like battery storage and things like what we call distributed energy resources, we'll talk about that later, uh, things like distributed energy resources are going to become more increasingly important to help us either store energy, dispatch energy, or consume energy when the time is right. Because the utility grid has to have, the utility grid ultimately would be happy with a very mild curve throughout the day. This is not very happy for the utility right now. And so what that means for you is that we now enter this phase where consumers are now turning into prosumers or essentially producing consumers. Oops, sorry that picture went really bad. That's not very illustrative of what I wanted to show. <laughs> but basically what was supposed to be in this image is, is a home that has an electric vehicle in the garage, it has a smart thermostat, it has a battery system, it has uh, controls for lighting, and if you have the ability to control when those things work, you might actually have some value that you can provide to the utility. And there's money in that value. So the question that I'm posing to this panel, we're going to have an open discussion on, is how will community choice energy, uh, electrification, and distributed energy resources uh, impact the future of energy? So uh, that's it for now. I'm going to actually turn it over to uh, Annette, who also has a few slides. Uh, she can talk about where Southern California Edison is thinking about this in this same similar space from their perspective. And then we'll turn it over to the TEDs to talk about uh, their experience and how they see uh, this happening in their respective fields. Hi, my name is um, Annette, and as Garrett said, I work at Southern California Edison, where I am in the energy and environment energy and um, environmental policy advisor. Um, and today, uh, I just wanted to speak with you regarding um, the clean power and electrification pathway. So Southern California Edison um, has, um, has a proposal to fight climate change and improve air quality. So I just wanted to discuss with you um, what those um, plans look like. One of the biggest, the biggest questions we're facing as utilities is how to prevent um, climate change. And the question is um, undeniably complicated and in some cases um, extremely controversial, but we know it will take all of us to create this change. So um, if we want to take a stance against climate change um, and improve our air quality, we have to stop depending on carbon. Um, cars and trucks, electricity, water heating, these have got to move away from using carbon. And California is a prime um, example of why. We have two of the nation's um, largest ports, and there's heavy goods movement throughout um, the region, especially around the 710. Um, we depend on cars to get around, um, and buildings rely on natural gas for heating. Um, and unfortunately, we have some of the worst air quality in the nation. Um, just to give you some background, California has set a goal to improve, and we have some major steps um, to reach by 2030. So in this chart, you'll see um, California's goals to reduce uh, emissions by 
40% below 1990 levels by 2030. Um, right now, we're about even with 1990 levels, um, despite our population increasing by 9.5 million. Um, and we've done well to reduce emissions so far, but we still have a long way to go in, in a very short period of time of only 12 years. Um, and the question is, how do we get there in a way that's affordable, sustainable, um, and, and good for the economy and good for you and me, right? So, um, working for utility, we think that electricity could be a game-changing, um, affordable alternative. And there's a practical reason why. Um, it all starts with the fact that we know if we want to get to zero emissions, uh, we have to replace many things that um, we rely on today to re require combustion. And so, we see in the emissions contributors that the largest contributor um, is transportation followed by the electric sector. Um, and as much as um, for the electric sector, um, we, even if it's down to zero, it's still a long shot um, to reach that 40% reduction in emission. Um, and we can't go to any one of these sectors and say, hey, no more carbon for you, find another way, um, although we'd like to. Um, that would really, um, would, would unfairly force that sector to pick up those costs, right? And it wouldn't be the most effective or economical way to create real change. So SCE, um, in its pathway, has um, developed um, a potential solution, a three-part integrated solution to tackle some of the largest emission contributors um, that are contributing to poor air quality and climate change. Um, so the best solution we think is to combine these three, decarbonizing the electric sector, trans electrify the transportation sector, and third, electrify buildings. Um, and I'll go through a little bit of each. So first, solution one, cleaning the power grid. Um, I believe someone had asked about um, the generation mix. Um, and currently, it's um, Southern California Edison delivers about 40% renewable energy um, to customers, and basically by 2030, we hope to double that amount to 80% um, carbon-free resources. Um, secondly, um, electrified, electrified vehicles. Um, by 2030, we need to have Southern California Edison believes that we need to need to have seven million electric electric vehicles on the road. Um, currently, we have the state of California has around three hundred thousand. Um, are there any EV drivers here? Yes, yes. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, and we really do think that you all are change agents. Um, the studies um, out of UC has shown that. You know, really, um, the way to change trends and attitudes and just electrical vehicle awareness is to really, you know, these these ride and drives that we have here. Um, that um, hopefully you've um, had a chance to drive at this event will really um, promote electric vehicle adoption and accelerate transportation electrification. So thank you, EV drivers, and spread the word, spread the good word. Um, because transportation does account for 39% of emissions um, today. And one of the things that Edison is really trying to um, focus on now, and some of the work that I'm trying to do, is to increase um, infrastructure. Um, there's really two big barriers. First is um, electrical, electric vehicle awareness. And second is the sense of range anxiety that there's not gonna be enough places to charge. And you've heard the um, gentleman in the previous uh, panel discuss that. Um, and at Edison, we're trying to develop um, pilots and request our regulators um, to, uh, to allow Edison to promote um, greater infrastructure at multi-unit dwellings where folks um, who have EVs might have difficulties charging, um, where they don't, might not have a, a parking space of their own and they can't have um, you know, they can't hook up very easily. So we're trying to promote um, and create incentives um, and rebates to help defray some of those costs um, so that there will be more uh, infrastructure 
um, and more places um, for charging. And third is to electrify buildings. Um, it's not the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions today, but it's dependent on fossil fuels, and it doesn't need to be. Um, we can provide new standards and incentives to get one third of space and um, water heating in homes and businesses electrified. Um, I am not an expert in um, building electrification, but I know that there are um, continuous work to be done, uh, with, especially with new construction and um, various rebates um, to um, to promote and advance um, space and water heating in buildings. And so lastly, um, really just want to get um, the word out that but we, um, Edison is trying to meet the state schools and more importantly cre help create healthier communities. Um, we do think that uh, a future is possible where um, the energy that powers our lives and pr propels us forward um, can be provided with the Earth's um, clean resources. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Annette. Um, I'll ask uh, Ted Barkey to perhaps tell us a little bit about the Clean Power Alliance and how, uh, where Edison's goals and the Clean Power Alliance's goals are potentially similar, and what do you see with changing roles in terms of uh, local governments and the utilities? Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Hi, good afternoon again. I'm Ted Barkey. I'm Executive Director of the Clean Power Alliance of Southern California, which um, we'll start serving uh, electricity here in Santa Monica um, sometime in 2019. Um, as Garrett mentioned, um, our role will be to procure energy on behalf of local communities in um, the renewable energy space, in low carbon space, in zero carbon resources, um, deliver them over uh, the lines and wires of Edison, uh, and yeah, it is kind of loud, isn't it? Yeah. Should I hold it down here? Is that better? No. No? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, and people will still receive the same bill. It'll be one bill. It'll look like an Edison bill. Except where it says generation, it'll start saying Clean Power Alliance of Southern California. And the idea behind this is that um, for the past 100 years, um, people in Santa Monica have had no choice of where to procure their energy. They had to procure it from Edison, and Edison was very much uh, driven by um, sort of regulatory and legislative um, structures. And right now, we've got a pretty good um, policy machine in, in California uh, pushing renewables, but um, it's not always been that way. And um, we also need to move, as Garrett mentioned, faster, quicker, and with really offering local folks the choice of how far, how fast, how much they want to pay for, how do we get to, um, to that long-term goal of clean power, of 100% clean power. So a um, couple of ideas. One is that as we roll out service here, um, you as residents of Santa Monica will have a number of options of rates and renewable um, products that you can choose from. So we'll offer, for those of you who um, are most price conscious, we'll offer something that is um, uh, sort of in, in the baseline a little bit greener than Edison. For those of you who want to take another step further, we'll offer something um, that is, uh, right now, our middle tier is the 2030 mandate, 11 years early. So we will offer that at a price that's competitive with Edison. Um, and then we'll offer a 100% renewables product that will also be 100% greenhouse gas free. Um, we're able to do this at prices that are lower for a couple of reasons. One is that um, as renewable prices have fallen um, quite dramatically over the past five or six years, we're not, um, ten years, we're not necessarily burdened with some of those long-term costs. So we are, um, you know, in some sense a benefit from being 
a late mover. But the other reason that we can do it is really you all will be our shareholders. You all, we will not have to pay dividends to, um, to shareholders. We will have to pay our dividends and our equity in our local communities. Now, again, as, as owners of this utility, along you know, with our, um, there's some responsibility and there's some uh, uh, benefits. Right? So the responsibility, the benefits I've just described, the responsibility is going to be really that you all take an active role in your energy decisions and how you manage your energy, what kind of energy you use, um, how much, uh, uh, and how to be, as Gary mentioned, a prosumer. You know, if you think about what happened in water in the drought, right? Everybody became an active manager of their water use, right? It was just like, it was so much in front of us, this water crisis. Everyone got the message, and we turned, you know, we changed our sprinklers, and we changed out the things, but you became managers of the water. And what we really want to promote is that you do the same thing in energy. It's going to help with the depth curve, and it's also going to help um, what Annette said about how we move to a greenhouse gas free future. Because we do need to electrify transportation, we do need to electrify buildings. And if you think about who has the most control over transportation and buildings in the state of California, it's local government, right? Local government controls transportation policy inside their, their communities, and they also have a say over building codes. And so to the extent that we, um, as a utility owned by our local governments, and working with the incumbent utility can all partner up and use our various powers of procurement, of regulation, and of lines and wires to promote fuel switching and to promote fuel switching to a very, very, very high renewable level of, of electricity. I think we're all, you know, make a step towards um, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and helping, for example, the city of Santa Monica, but more broadly. LA and Ventura County meet its climate goals. Thank you. Ted Flanagan, uh, it seems like your work is, is at the, okay, it seems like your work uh, feels like it's at the intersection of, of where Southern California Edison, uh, the Clean Power Alliance, and where the cities are coming together in terms of looking at renewable energy, uh, advanced energy systems, distributed energy systems, becoming prosumers. Can you talk about your work and what you're seeing in uh, for the Future of Energy? I, I, would love, I would love to. Is this, is this on? Is this Ted work? Ooh, I just thought, ooh, that's fine. Did, has everybody had a great day here today? Inspired? Is anybody not inspired today? Oh, thank goodness. Everybody's there. And I think really, the uh, in many ways, uh, the future is here and it's now, right here in Santa Monica. So I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes for a second. Be careful. It's the end of the day. Close your eyes for a second. Imagine a future where there's no wires. Imagine a future where there's no wires. There's no transmission lines. There's no distribution lines. Is that crazy? Yes. That's crazy. That's to the future. But imagine what people said when they said, imagine phones with no wires. Does anybody, has anybody seen a telephone pole lately? Does anybody have a landline anymore? A few of us still have landlines, right? but most of us are on cellular. Imagine uh, an era, and I'm going out to the future, where there are no more central power plants. Many of our power plants are along the coast. Imagine that they become resorts, they become healing centers, they become yoga centers, they become new age vortices. Imagine our transmission corridors are now for birds, they're for biking, they're for hiking, they're for renewables. It's a totally different energy future that we may all live to see. Our energy future may be 100% disrupted, like phone service, like taxis with Uber, like hotels with Airbnb, like shopping with Amazon. It's hard to envision what this future might be, but I think it may be fair to say that it will be totally different than what we know now. We can't envision it, but it will be different. And it will be 
100% responsible. It will be, as Ted said and Annette said, it will be 100% clean energy. Many of us will not have just net zero homes and schools and businesses, but will be net positive so that we can shut power to those that can't do that. The future will be a combination of localized power, which is our business, is what we're passionate about delivering in the city of Santa Monica. It'll also be a combination of central renewable plants. You know, the duck curve is based largely on solar and California's predominance of solar. When we bring offshore wind to the United States, we're going to have lots of, of uh, energy, clean energy, all, all, all through the day. What about that wireless transmission I mentioned? Is that totally crazy? Is it totally crazy or is it not totally crazy? How many people have an electric toothbrush? That's inductive charging, right? It's not metal on metal. It's going through plastic. We've, we've seen bus systems in Korea now. A bus pulls up to a charger. This unit comes down, hovers over the bus, and zap, it zapped that bus. Imagine using microwaves for the transmission of power. Imagine using hydrogen, electrolyzed, electrolyzed water for the transmission of power. Imagine using lasers that connect with PV receptors for long distance transmission power. That technology is already powering electric, electric planes. Distributed generation, really an exciting opportunity. This is our bag here at EcoMotion. This is what we're doing in Santa Monica. Any resident in Santa Monica that wants help going solar or wants help going adding storage to their home or wants help figuring out electric vehicles and how that fits into, the, into your energy equation can call us and, and get free advice for your honest brokers. We're here to help you out. Solar Santa Monica. Our website, by the way, has lots of information on going solar, has lots of really high quality solar contractors for you to start with. You think about the distributed generation future, it's all based on renewables. Buckminster Fuller produced a fantastic map of the United States where he looked at every region of the country and identified renewables that are abundant and that can easily power the region. You think of the Northwest with its hydro. You think of the Southwest where we are with its solar. You think of the Midwest with its wind. Every region of the country has abundant renewable energy that allows us to go to this clean energy future that Annette and Tim were both talking about. Distributed generation. How many people have solar on their roof right now? How many people send their kids to schools that have solar on them? We're just, we're just beginning, right? We've only hit about 2% of the, of the rooftops in California thus far. This is, a, this is a big, exciting movement. But distributed generation allows us to have control, local control, our own control. It allows us to take responsibility. There's lots of financing mechanisms now. Financing is not the barrier anymore. The barrier is the awareness. The barrier is the inertia. It's the taking the step to be part of this movement. When we, when we put solar on our rooftops, we're avoiding, we're supporting the local economy. We're avoiding transmission and distribution losses that are about 5% of all power losses in the country. We're potentially building resilience in our communities. If we, couple, if we couple solar with storage, we can actually have resilience in our homes and in our schools and throughout our community. We can make a profit from our rooftops. Talk to several multifamily building owners here in Santa Monica today about their rooftops. These are profit centers. It's a new way of looking at your roof. You can make cash off of your roof. And for, uh, for apartments, there's community solar options that we could talk to you about. I want to just spend a minute talking about a project that we're working on up in Monterey County. Michael Ware and I were just up in Monterey earlier this week at a ribbon cutting. We've taken six school campuses and we've turned them into carbon-free microgrids. We're really proud of it. No money down, fully financed. We put solar on every campus. It provides 100% of each campus's electricity requirement. We switch the, the, the campuses to a different rate structure. That's a little complex, but an important part of the equation. We put lots of batteries on every campus. We've got a megawatt hour, a megawatt hour of batteries on these campuses. We, we also put in very advanced, Drew did actually, put in very advanced control systems on these campuses so that if the grid goes down on a rainy day, we're able to toggle down our power consumption and, and operate these, um, these campuses with, without any external power at all. We're able to what's called island. It's the definition of a microgrid. A microgrid can island, can isolate itself from the macro grid. Our, our microgrids are carbon free. They can operate indefinitely. 
They were fully financed at parity, meaning the school district now will pay no more than they used to pay to PG&E for all the services that we're giving them. So we're very proud of that. And I said to the superintendent of the district, you know, you're awfully close. You're awfully close to being able to disconnect completely from the grid. That may not be what you want to do. There's no incentive to do that. But you actually have the capability. And that's why I say the future is really here. It's really here right now. We are awfully close to a radically different form of providing energy for our homes and businesses and schools and communities. The last thing I want to talk about with you just really briefly is being part of the future, being part of the movement, pressing for this clean power vision. And how do we do it? And I want to just talk about my own home and what I've done and what I'm planning on doing. And I welcome advice. So I've already become as efficient as I think I know how to do uh, in terms of lots of insulation and new windows, LED lights, Energy Star appliances, the whole bit. And even in, in more important than that, it's just turning stuff off when it's not in use. So I've gone in and I've become energy efficient in terms of technology, but also in terms of behavior. We put up a solar system last year, large enough to 100% power the house, our Airbnb in the back, and my electric vehicle. I now have an electric vehicle, I'm a very proud electric vehicle driver. I promised I would never get an EV until I had my own solar system to charge it because I don't want to power my EV with anything close to nuclear or coal, any, any trace of any of those, what I call those nasties in my life. So my solar system is 100% powering my home. So what are the next steps? More solar. My wife wants an EV now, so we've got to get more solar to cover that. Uh, Ultimately, I'm going to be swapping out appliances, and this is a radical thought, and this is something that years ago I never envisioned. You know, we always considered natural gas the prince of the hydrocarbons, right? It's much better for heating than, than oil, and that's half the carbon intensity. Um, we, were, we, we saw natural gas as a, as a beneficial fuel, but as we're, as we're shifting to this um, completely clean power economy, what do I have to do? I've got to change out my furnace. I already have a heat pump. And one of, my, one of my units, so that's electric, right? It heats and cooled. Now I've got to take out my furnace, which uses natural gas. I got to take, I've already got a, I've got an on-demand hot water heater. Bomber, that's a nice unit, but that's natural gas too. So that's got to get swapped out with electricity. What's the next step? Storage is my next step. Batteries. Now we've all heard about batteries, the lithium-ion revolution. This is pretty exciting stuff. If you're in an area that has a time of use periods. Sometimes storage can make a lot of sense for you. We can analyze that for you, by the way. We've got software that allows us to analyze solar plus storage to figure out what are the optimal sizes for you. Bigger the better is always good for, for storage, right? It's nice to have a lot of battery, a lot of battery power, a lot of juice in the tank, but that's expensive, so we've got to figure out what is the optimal level of solar, so storage, excuse me. And then I realized, hey, wait a second, the, the EV, that's got 60 kWh setting up. What happened? What if I have a party or something that's going on, or the kids have a party, and we need a bunch of power? Well, then my, my electric vehicle becomes part of that household energy management system. And then I'm right at the point of being able to disconnect from the grid. I don't know if I want to do that. Right now, I've got a heck of a good deal with my utility. They're providing me with all this backup, a net energy meter like crazy. I'm a happy camper. But I'm at that point where I'm right where I'm talking about in the future. Right? I started off by saying, what about a future with no wires? That's it. I can keep getting rid of I At that point, I don't need the distribution system. I don't need the transmission system. I don't need those big, ugly power plants that we see belching, belching smoke and, and uh, fumes. I, I don't have to be part of that. What I do want to do is I want to keep pressing forward, and I want to be a consumer. I want to produce more than I consume. I want to be able to help out Jerry and send power to carrots house or whatnot. But this is a future where we're all moving towards, where we're able to do, we're able to take steps in our own homes, in our own businesses, in our own cities, in our own schools, to set this model for the future, which is really positive. We can help you get there cost effectively. Nothing that I talked about today was not cost effective. The school district up in Santa Rita was all done at parity. The savings on my house, I've got one heck of a return on my investment going on for the savings on my house. The work that we do with most homes in Santa Monica, we can show you that we can do this in 
create not only an environmental benefit, a social benefit, but also a bottom line benefit for you. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. So uh, we have about uh, just less than 15 minutes left in the time. I'd like to turn it over to the audience. I think you can tell um, that we have a great range of experience and perspective. And I think hopefully we painted for you where we, we, we all see the future of energy going. Um, it's one where there isn't too much competition in each other's space, I think, um, which is important to understand. I think when people uh, talk about particularly uh, community choice programs and utilities, there are some antagonistic relationships, and that's particularly in the north and the south uh, southern utility areas. Um, because there's a lot of gas fire generation, there's a lot of other assets that those uh, entities uh, have that are, are their liabilities, is basically it's saying. Um, but I think we're, we're fortunate that we're in Southern California, Edison, that Edison is looking ahead to a clean energy path um, forward um, to help the state become carbon neutral. And we have great uh, assets like EcoMotion uh, helping local businesses, local uh, property owners uh, to essentially make that transition transition for their own properties. So that's kind of the summation of, of what I wanted to convey here. And uh, I'll, I'll start taking some questions. And I will remind you please that a question typically starts with a what, how, when, or who, okay, or where. Um, we don't, questions do not come at the end of a five minute lecture, okay? So before we answer the question, would you mind just repeating it on the microphone? Yeah. And so the, the question is, um, if I'm plugging in an electric vehicle, how much more am I spending on electricity than, than my neighbor? Is that right? Or how much is the bill? Uh, how much is the bill going there? So um, a couple of, couple of ways to look at that. Um, uh, I charge my electric vehicle pretty much every night. I just plug it into the wall. Um, and I've noticed, but I, I drive it downtown Los Angeles every day. So I'm driving, you know, 30 miles a day. And I'm seeing probably that drive is costing me about 30 cents in electricity every day. Um, what? Well, if, if 30 cents for 20 days of Commute, that's about five bucks. Um, right. So, so what, what has, what I haven't done in the past three and a half years is visited a gas station. I haven't put my credit card into that gas pump. I've paid the utility some, I've paid LADWP a little bit more, um, but I have not bought gasoline in three and a half years. And, and then, or, and, 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 I'm, and I've saved quite a bit of money along the way. And then, would you mind talking a little bit about Edison? Yes, it does cost charging us. rates, perhaps. Oh. I'd be happy to tell you about my economics too at, at any point. But um, EVs are getting around 100 miles per gallon is one way of looking at it. So if you're just thinking, uh, if you're just comparing that to your existing car, it's kind of a simple metric. Yeah, we would be happy to um, run the, the numbers for you. Oh, okay. If you're, so you don't know how much an electric car. It's it's all it's all going to vary based on how many miles you drive. What well, kind of well, car you get? I'm, I'm thinking that cars run out of every time I plug it in. I, I use all the battery. I have to recharge 100. So we have a solar Santa Monica program. Ted is behind that program through oh, EcoMotion. Well, we, we we handle all sorts of energy related issues, um, and so that's the program that we'll we'll, we'll help you through. Uh, there's a question in, in front of her. Yes, go ahead.
Yes. Yes. So um, our our organization um, it's a public company um, uh, owned by uh, it's called a Joint Powers Authority. We have unincorporated LA County, unincorporated Ventura County, and 29 cities within those within those counties. So we go as far north as Ojai, and so we have Ojai and Ventura and Oxnard and Camarillo and all of those areas, Simi Valley. I'll tell you one thing, you know, people say Simi Valley, oh, you know, like that's a more conservative place. Simi Valley has a higher density of solar panels and EVs than Santa Monica does. Um, and um, it's because, you know, people have, have bigger houses and drive more, and so they see the economics a little bit more. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff that people have. We also have um, in LA, uh, many of your usual suspects, so West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, Malibu, Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach. Um, and, but then we have some folks who you might not normally think about. Carson, home to big oil refineries. Um, Hawaiian Gardens, Paramount, Downey, um, places with uh, very low incomes and very high air pollution. And those cities joined because they really want to be part of, they don't want to be left behind anymore. They want to be part of um, this energy revolution. And they really believe that by partnering together, um, we'll be able to transform the region. Great. Uh, question right here. solar and wind, and some geothermal. Um, coal, zero. Good for them. That's in LA DWP territory. That's DWP. No, they're different than DWP. So, no coal. Good. Thank you. 6% um, uh, large hydro. 19% uh, natural gas. 6% uh, nuclear and 41% of what you call unspecified sources of power. And that unspecified sources of power usually is a mixture of large hydro, uh, natural gas, and nuclear. So um, actually they're doing pretty well, um, uh, but it's pretty much in baseline of what is required by the state. So the state doesn't let you have any more coal, um, any new coal coming in. That their DWP plant uh, out in Four Corners and the one up in, in Utah is being shut down. Um, uh, and the 28% is um, right in line with what state law requires. State law will require 33% by, by 2020. So one of the things that we're trying to bring into this um, is choice and competition and um, trying to go farther faster. So our base product, the product that most cities have chosen to use, is 50% renewables straight out the bat, which is the state mandate for 2030. Edison's also catching up. They'll hit 50% before 2030. Um, and that's 
that's good. That is definitely what competition brings and what choice brings. And I'm excited that they're you know, catching up. Another question? Thank you. 
Well, we've been a big fan of solar sandbox for feed-in tariffs for, for solar, so that uh, we can so we can put large arrays on top of uh, multifamily apartment buildings or or condos, and that that transaction that power would just be shunted or just sent right off to the grid, and we have a single transaction. What becomes really difficult is when you've got we just Henry and I were talking earlier. He's got 16 uh, condos or 16 townhouses, one roof. Okay, now it's time for group therapy, right? We got to get everybody together. We got to get everybody talking. We got to get everybody aligned uh, in order to reach that critical mass. But I'm really glad, Ted, that you're working on that split incentive with the, with the programs. And and I would just say, uh, going back to the power content of the power mix label, because I'm from New York and worked in the New York utility world for early in my career. We have, Edison is one of the best utilities in the country. It has been always one of the most diverse utilities in the country. It's been always a leader in terms of renewables. So our, our baseline, frankly, is pretty darn good. And now what Ted is doing with the Clean Power Alliance is just even better. Totally cool. If we can have, if we can have even more green power sooner and at lower cost or even at parity, what a huge accomplishment. And then what, what I've been talking about is, is really just taking it that next step. It's just bringing it right down to that household level or to that end user level and figuring out how we can take action at that level. So uh, I would say our, our fallback position in that is pretty is wonderful and, and it's really, we're in one of the most exciting power markets in the country right now. Yeah, and, and I just have to say, um, thanks Ted, um, but I um, previously, before coming to Southern California Edison, I was working in for utilities in um, New York and Massachusetts, and so definitely Southern California Edison is definitely a leader in the industry. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, so Southern California Edison is definitely um, uh, a leader in the utilities and promoting um, renewable. Renewables. Um, just to get back to Garrett's question about um, implementing these programs, Edison has been very um, active in market education and outreach, and certainly for specifically our transportation electrification programs, we've been working with um, MUDs to try to, or multi unit dwellings, to um, try to um, get folks to share those parking spaces um, and, um, you know, uh, find rebates in um, which they can um, uh, better use um, the, the, the different um, re rebates that we have at the company. Thank you. I'm going to have to close it at that, uh, but I would like to thank our panel for, uh, for this discussion.